Okay, welcome everyone to, oh wow, lots of hands waving, hi. <laughs> Great. Welcome to this week's episode of From the Bottom Up with um, my special guest, David Hoffmeister. <laughs> and you can come back to me now. <laughs> so today we are going to look at the topic of immigration, which in the grand scheme is really going from from believing form is outside of our mind to to bringing it in, it in and immigrating into a whole state of mind. I don't think I've ever used immigration in that in that way before, but what I'd like to do as usual is start out on the surface of things and to the extent that we can, yeah, really stir up any emotions or thoughts either in the studio audience or, or online, we'll do that so that we can have an authentic going down deep into the mind. And I, I would like to come at this topic from a few different angles with a couple of videos, some uh, quotes from some supporters of different sides of the immigration, and then uh, a story that I have and, and ultimately probably transcending right over into the depths with David. So maybe the first thing we could put up is, uh, Nicholas, you could show the hot topic of the week was Melania Trump's jacket as she boarded an airplane to go visit the immigrants who uh, are having the children separated from the adults as the adults are being prosecuted. That was early on this, this week. So while he's, while he's doing that, maybe I'll just uh, explain it a little, but one of the things that everybody was really up in arms about this week was this idea of the children being separated and Melania, who is Flotus, or the uh, first lady, is supposed to go down there, everybody thinks, and basically show how much she loves and cares while this is going on, because, of course, it's a controversial topic. What do you do when everybody wants to follow the laws of the land and have immigration stopped and have legal immigration, but nobody likes to separate the children from the parents? And yet that's the only way you can stop it is prosecuting them to deter it. This is, you know, what's up in the media. So he's got it. Okay, go ahead. So this, these are the, the mames, which is let them eat cake. But maybe we can scroll down to her actual jacket right there. Maybe make it a little bigger so people can see. There we go. So there she is boarding the plane and it's saying, I really don't care. Do you? <laughs> I can't see uh, Queen Elizabeth wearing something like that, but it's hard for me. David, <laughs> I really can't see Queen Elizabeth wearing something like that. Okay, let's scroll down a bit and see some of the comments. So they're memming her thing. November is coming, which is um, alluding to the fact that midterm elections are coming in November and everyone's going to rally the cry to get Trump out of there. Keep going down. Let's see what else we got here. Let them eat cake. That's referring to um, Marie Antoinette, I guess, in French, French history, where basically the peasants were starving and she said, why don't they just have cake, which is this even richer bread than regular bread with butter and eggs, like totally showing that she has no understanding of the people that she was meant to serve. Okay. My husband admitted to sexual assault. Okay. I think we've had enough of the names. <laughs> so... What I'd like to do now is play the video, Nicholas, the first video, just a couple minutes of it, I'll tell you when to stop, that shows very quickly here within a minute, I think it's Time Magazine's coverage of this whole thing that's been going on at the border until some just rec Trump recently just signed an executive order stopping it. But 
Let's go show that video. Okay. We'll just see if Laverne or Soren had any strong, still have any strong reactions to that that you want to come and share before I. Welcome, Laverne. Yeah, thanks, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think what really sparked it for me or the emotions was just I had um, read an article of a, uh, a photographer that spent like 24 hours with this mother and child um, leading up to uh, being arrested at the border. And um, yeah, this photographer was just saying he was looking for his like shot that was gonna make him well known or whatever, but then he kind of got caught up in all the emotion of the situation in terms of just, uh, it was a, a young mother and uh, a, ch a child. And then, you know, he got his pictures that he was wanting basically the separate, the point of separation where this, like a, the three-year-old, daughter was just being pulled away from the mother's arms while she's getting frisked by by a border patrol and i i don't know it just really like brought up a lot of emotion for me just in terms of just this kind of like motherly bond seems so like essential or uh, primal in that you know and it just for me just re recognizing that a lot of these people that are being detained at the border are these young women that are just, I mean, they're from war-torn countries with, you know, a lot of drug trafficking going on, and they're just looking for, for a better life, you know, with, for their child. So I think that's where the emotion comes up for me, is really who these people are when you see their faces and, and hear their stories. Yeah, it's kind of being spontaneous. Cause, yeah, do you have any thoughts come to you about that before I show the next video? Or just kind of let it unfold. I just, I have a lot of uh, experience with uh, immigration myself because uh, I've been crossing uh, borders of countries under the Holy Spirit's guidance for, I, I just figured 15 years from 2003 to 2018. So. I've had literally hundreds and hundreds of these crossings. And I think um, for me, it was always the question of what is it for? And the purpose was, I was, I was, why was I traveling so much? Why was I crossing so many borders? In some countries it's called immigration. In some countries it's called passport control. But you have to go through these um, question and answer things, sometimes interrogation, sometimes being taken off to a room to be interrogated. So I have a lot of hundreds and hundreds of firsthand experiences, but, but also for me, it was really always about what is it for and what is the purpose? Why am I there? Because it, it can't really be about a body crossing over a border or entering a country. That's just too simplistic. That's how the world sees everything. You go to a fast food restaurant to order fast food and eat. You cross a border because you're wanting to go from one country into another. But um, initially, I just know I would watch my emotions with every single crossing, and um, and knowing that there was no guaranteed outcome, like there was no guarantee that I would actually be allowed into the country because it's not only crossing a border, but you have to get some kind of a stamp permission. permission. There's rules, regulations, and there's questions usually that you have to answer and so forth. So to me, it, it started to quickly boil down to what is my purpose? And when I would watch my emotions, I could tell whether I was, as Jeffrey was saying in his show, whether I was in the, the yes of the miracle or whether I was into a personal perception of the situation, a border crossing. Mm -hmm. And when I was into the border crossing perception, then there were uh, emotions, mm -hmm. uh, not 
pleasant emotions. Mm -hmm. It could be stress, it could be concern or whatever. And then um, when I was in the miracle, it was, I, I didn't have a, an outcome or expectation planned and, and yeah, it, it was what it was. <laughs> so it was never the outcome that I was really after because I felt like I was guided to do this and it was all under Christ's control. And if I was meant to cross into another country, it would happen. And if I wasn't meant mm -hmm. to, the script is written and I wouldn't. And I never did think, oh, there's people waiting for me and I'll be letting down the host because that's all personal. Mm -hmm. It was just like, okay, well, let's just mm -hmm. see what uh, what's in the plan. It's interesting because when Laverne and Soren and I were first talking about this topic, we came to that idea that the mind meets and gets exactly what it wants. And it's really not your experience to have difficulty with those kinds of encounters, but there's a healing that's going on for for everybody involved in these situations. But I quickly saw that in talking about this, and Soren was sharing some ideas about it being different worldly values conflicting, because in Europe they have regulations, they don't encounter this, and in America, you know, they take in over two thirds of the world's refugees and immigrants more than all the others combined and they're getting up in arms but my heart didn't really spark with any of that where where my heart sparked in terms of wanting to go for healing was if i could read to you some comments around trump's no tolerance policy so even the idea of zero tolerance policy so this is from a new york times article In interviews across the country over the last few days, dozens of Trump voters, as well as pollsters and strategists, described something like a bonding experience with the president that happens each time Republicans have to answer a now familiar question. How can you possibly still support this man? Their resilience, the supporters, suggests a, lev a level of unity that could help mitigate Mr. Trump's low overall approval ratings. He's not a perfect guy. He does some stu stupid stuff, says Tony Schwartz of Lino Lakes. But when they're hounding him all the time, it just gets old. Give the guy a little. For many Republicans, the audio of children sobbing at a migrant detention center, which I think you mentioned earlier, barely registered. And you know, most of the world was up in arms because these voters don't pay attention to the left-leaning and mainstream media that have covered the family separation crisis far more than their preferred channel. Fox News. I think it's terrible about the kids, kids getting split up from their parents, but the parents shouldn't have been there. So, so for me in the course, there's a section called Salvation Without Compromise, which is really no tolerance for the ego, or really acknowledging there is no ego, salvation without tolerance. And see, so I would hear these terms like zero tolerance, and something about that resonates <laughs> So now this is where I'm going to risk everything because it's going to look like I understand Trump, which I want to go into the healing of this. <laughs> so it's similar to the course, and the, but the, it has an edge to it. And a classic story that makes me get locked up, I, I'd like to share with you to go into for the healing. Because Soren and I and Laverne started talking about this. Uh, years ago, I lived with some gypsies in in Kosovo and I lived in their little Mahalo which is very very tiny it's kind of like being in a in India in those slums or whatever mm -hmm. maybe a little bit bigger and it was in it was kind of at the end of the Bosnian uh, Herzegovina Kosovo war that whole thing you know where the Americans went over and helped stop Milos Milosevic from bombing the Albanians so there's tanks running through the street and I'm there because so far the Albanians and the Serbians are at peace. They're not killing each other anymore. But both of them hate the gypsies. The, they call them Rom Romani kids or whatever. And so I'm living with them so that they can go out to um, get food and go to the, the bank or whatever they need to do. Otherwise they get shot by the Serbians or the Albanians. When there's a foreigner there, they don't get shot. So I was watching these kids and I, I actually took them to, to this wide open field because they had never left their little village except for these little trips. And it, it was, was managed by the Greek forces. And, and I said, I'd like to take these kids for a hike here. And they said, well, there's landmines in all of these places, but if you keep them on this trail, everything would be okay. And I thought, okay, that's worth the risk. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> so I just really wanted them to get outside and you know, extend their consciousness or be happy or whatever. So I took these 20 or 30, maybe 40, took a couple trips of these gypsy kids who, you know, people say Italians are wild and, and crazy. Albanians make Italians look calm. calm. Gypsies make Abal Albanians look calm. Like they're mm -hmm. just, whatever it is, they're, that's why there's these amazing dancers, you know, they can get up there and dance and everything. Mm -hmm. So I put these 20 to 40 kids on this track and say, stay here on this track. They didn't last 10 seconds. They were gone everywhere throughout this field. And my heart was just like, <gasps> you know, in this panic, like I'm going to be responsible for one of them blowing up for these landmines. But kind of like Benito here, I just realized I had no control if another dog was going to bite him. I didn't know the language. I couldn't control him. So anyways, luckily no one got blown up. It was a great day. But at the end of the day, we walked by these fruit trees that were Serbian fruit trees. And they went, right before we were going to get in the truck to go back home, they, they went and filled up all their shirts and bags with the fruit these trees and I just was like I'm not I am not going to be a part of theft where they are going to get in trouble from Serbians and the very job I'm here to do is to protect them from the Serbians and Albanians they're going to get even in a worse situation so I refuse to let them get on the car with any fruit and even my com my comrades the others that were working with me at the nonprofit were like what are you doing why are you being so so firm and hard, and I did feel an edge, but I, I could feel there was some, now looking back, some fear to it, but I thought I was doing the right thing for all concerns so there would be no more war and no more struggles. And when I see Trump saying zero policy, I don't resonate with some, a lot of like anything about it, but I resonate with this, he's trying to take a solution that will finally make make it right for everybody and someone's got to be you know but it's got this hard edge to it and I know it's not right I can I know I can feel it's not right but it comes up quite a lot right as like this other video I was going to show of the Germans welcoming the Syrians in years ago it just makes my heart like expand and I resonate with that direction this hard zero tolerance I don't like but there's a part of my mind that resonates with it so I thought maybe you could Help me with that. Talk about it and go into if, what's going on yeah. with that. Well, you know, we're here to talk about spiritual awakening. We're here to talk about forgiveness, accepting atonement. In fact, atonement is the sole responsibility, as I was saying last night at the movie. And and actually, forgiveness itself is extremely, extremely super super extremely extremely simple and and it's only <laughs> the, the stupidity of complexity that brings up all these uh unreal emotions these upsets because the god didn't create fear or any of these upsets they just are coming up because the mind is addicted to the ego and therefore addicted to complexity and you know as i was listening to uh to Frank and Jeffrey talk, Jeffrey was talking about the, do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Um, I remember in the early years of traveling all over the United States, people would give me music and um, somebody gave me a song from, I think it was Johnny and Nathan, two guys at some church and they turned that into a song. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Teach only love, for that is what you are. You know, I had that jingle going through my mind as I'm drive, driving around the country, and do I want the problem or do I want the answer? And actually, it's the difference between Newtonian, the perspective, when you were telling your whole Kosovo story, you know, there's all these aspects of nothingness that are included in it, and, and that's how humans see the world, through their belief system and the intricacies of what's going on politically, what's going on culturally, what's going on with the gypsy children. They probably are happy to be stuffing their shirts with fruit because it's like food, <laughs> right? They're not thinking whether it's legal or not, or, you know, everybody's 
just doing and acting out. The human being is acting out the belief systems in the mind, but the belief system in the mind is extremely complex. So ultimately, whether we apply it to immigration or to mathematics or to anything, it's going to have to be seen that the choice of purpose is what's important. That's what those lessons 79 and 80, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved and let me recognize my problems have been solved already. But you can't accept the correction or the solution until you correctly identify the problem. And the, the thing is, through the ego's lens, there seems to be millions, billions, mm. trillions of different problems on different levels. Mm. And, and from that point of view, you can see why people would even be suicidal because there's no hope of, mm. of solving so many compl mm. complex problems on so many different levels. You know, what about in the family? You know, like a, a, a Laverne was talking about the mother-child bond. That's very familial. That's very close. That's very interpersonal. And then you've got things like pollution and the ozone layer opening up. And, and what about asteroids and meteors hitting the Earth? And, and you know, all kinds of uh, issues on many, many different levels. NASA's working on trying to destroy meteors before they hit the earth now. You see how different that is from the level seemingly of a mother-child bond. But there is no solution on all these different levels. And so to me, what I was working on when I was crossing all these borders, starting in 2003, going down to South America, and then on and on and on, was how do I feel? What is my state of mind? Because I'm going for purification of consciousness. I'm going to for healing. I want to be emptied out of these false beliefs and concepts. I can see that Buddha had it right. I can see that Jesus had it right. I can see that Ramana Maharshi had it right. I, I'm tuned into it's a, my responsibility now to go through this purification and emptying out. And I'm not going to waste my time dinkering with ego distractions and projections and effects when there's too important of a mission for me and that's my state of mind being peaceful because if my mind's peaceful then the whole world's peaceful so when i read those things i can see i when i was crossing the borders i would look at the same thing i would go through these big queues in all kinds of different countries including the united states just coming back to the united states vast queues and everything and i would think wow, there's a lot of people crossing the border and they've got a lot of, of people to deal with and there has to be some kind of guidelines to simplify their situation. They do have rules. And I always, even if I didn't know what the rules were in, in the countries, I figured the border patrol people did know and they would ask me the questions and I would just answer. But I was always under the assumption that as long as I believe in the ego and believe in this world, there are all kinds of rules, even if I'm quite clueless. I was more like, like Mr. Magoo or Chauncey Gardner uh, moving around in these different countries. And I was probably even a little more clueless than them. And yet still, uh, if I would get searched or searched repeatedly or uh, if I would not know the rules, like one time I was going to Canada, that was probably the one place where I was interrogated the worst was Canada. Uh, I went to Canada, I landed, and a woman was supposed to pick me up, and I was just in the queue and coming to turn in my things and go through, and, and uh, she was outside circling, circling, there's some delays. So she called me up, and I, I made the mistake of answering my cell phone. <laughs> while I was coming up to the queue for the question and answer. As soon as I got up, I, the, my, the phone rang and it was her and she's like, are you coming out? Where are you? This I said, I can't talk right now. I've got to go. And they took me for 30 minutes of questioning <laughs> off down an alleyway and the Canadian border patrol, you know, for, I was interrogated for like 30 minutes because I answered, but I didn't consciously, I wasn't thinking, don't answer the phone. If it rings, just <laughs> let it ring. I wasn't at that point. So everything's an opportunity to come back to peace of mind, to forgiveness, and to letting go of thinking I know what's even happening because 
we know from quantum physics, you, the whole situation has been orchestrated and the whole situation is the mind. And it's, it's setting the goal section. It's all for peace. If you have the goal out front, then you'll perceive everything and everyone acting out their part perfectly for you to realize the peace of mind. But that is so different from the human perspective. That's why there's all these seeming debates and arguments and policies, yeah. you know, that just goes on and on. Well, that's what, because it, something about that energy that, like I feel what you're saying with all the specifics are actually ridiculous, but how that energy will still play out today is like with the idea of following guidance, you know, when Jesus gives us guidance and you follow it. And I, I remember feeling like how important that is. And I don't want to lose that importance, but there's also like a hard edge that comes into almost like forcing it or, or if you're, if you happen to be like a messenger and you're delivering a message to someone that feels outside of me and you, you don't always remember it's for you and then you, you deliver the message and they don't seem to follow and then they get in a hard situation and you're just part of the mind is kind of like, ah, they're in that position because they didn't follow, but you know, God forgives 70 times seven. So you want to turn into it again and you do and you do, but then they don't listen. How do you discern when, you know, there's that hard edge kind of a thing. I don't, so these were just different ideas that were coming up. That, yeah, I mean, that's one of the first things that you have to realize in the spiritual journey is that there is no they. Uh, and ultimately, there's no we. It's just the mind uh, tuning into spirit and listening and following. And then you, you do realize that you have to be uncompromising in the willingness to listen and follow. You know, what's it going to get you following the Holy Spirit 90% of the time? Uh, probably 90% of peace <laughs> you get from 90% of following. But if the mind was created as peace in its natural creation and it's only going to be satisfied with 100% peace, then you can see why you have to have zero tolerance for the ego. And it is important to have zero tolerance. It's just that when that gets projected out to form, that's the ego trying to offer a solution in form. Zero tolerance immigration policy. Or when people say, I, will, I did this, it was wrong, I will never do that again. Or I should have done that, I will always do that again. When you throw those big never and always words in terms of behavior, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a big setup. Yeah, yeah. What you want to do is you want to go to have zero tolerance for the ego, but that takes a lot of mind training and awakening is no small thing and it has to be your top priority because you're not even going to come close to zero tolerance for the ego you know there's a story of uh, um we do a round table here but um francis and i were over in uh, england and it was a miracles conference and it was a panel of all these course teachers and we're the end all the teachers come up we let the audience ask the questions of the teachers and then the audience was asking something about the ego and any of us could answer and we're just there and then the one guy just went i like my ego i enjoy my ego i you know and and, and francis was just in the audience going <laughs> david's up there david limit <laughs> 20 minutes and some guys going on and on about I like my ego uh, at, a, at a Course in Miracles conference she just was like rolling her eyes like you know like oh my god what a zoo <laughs> a zoo <laughs> it was just uh, crazy but but the thing is you know it's never about they it's never about them their reactions what they did or whatever that's that's the first error is to make it interpersonal but you have to be looking through a personal perspective for it to be interpersonal so does that mean if like if there's a force behind following guidance or uh this is important but got an edge to it that that it might not even be the guidance because you're you have to make it happen if it's the guidance it's more like okay i'm willing but you're kind of getting sucked as opposed to being personal so that yeah. might help you even to help me even determine what is guidance in the first yeah, I think I, I always say miracles are involuntary and they should not be under <laughs> conscious control. So 
I think the more habitually miracle minded you become, the more you yield into this flow. You know, it's like that old song from maybe the 60s or the 70s. I'm your puppet. The more you're in that, <laughs> I'm your puppet uh, mentality with the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit and Jesus. Mm -hmm then actually everything just feels like it's just flowing and happening. And there's not like this sense of, all right, I'm going to do this for you, but this is really going to hurt, you know, or, or, you know, all right, I'll do it. You know, because when you're going through the mind training, you do feel that sometimes like, all right, already. Okay. Yeah, you told right. me 45 times I'll do it, but I'm not happy about it. You know, that's, that's not miraculous. It's, it's actually still trying to do a miracle like it's a big thing yeah, yeah. And, and it's bravo. But it should be uh, involuntary. And I know for myself that I, the more I just am in the miracle state of mind, I'm, I'm very clueless about the world. Hmm. People can talk to me and I could still, Jesus will be in there and he'll just say, wait, wait, wait. And then he'll start speaking through me. But it's not like I even have to follow their conversations. I don't even have to follow their trains of thought. It's all mm -hmm. so autopilot mm -hmm. where Jesus just always knows to say the right thing, do the right thing or whatever, but there's a gentleness and an ease to it. It's never like a struggle. Mm -hmm. And there are no big miracles or small miracles. You know, you start to just feel like it's a natural moment you're just in the moment relaxed and everything's flowing and everything's perfect everything has always been perfect you just feel that presence you're in the presence but it's not like there are these big miracles it's not like uh, when you're facing fears like oh, i'm afraid of uh heights so i'm going to go skydiving or i'm mm. afraid of uh my body being hurt and damaged mm. so i'm going to walk on hot coals mm. you know or I'm afraid of public speaking, so I'm going to take Toastmasters and, and go week after week, and then I'm going to have my big break to go out and face my fear and speak mm -hmm. to all these people. That's, that's more as if the mind already knows what the fear is. Yeah, Jeffrey yeah. was talking about yeah, that with yeah. Rules for Decision, you know, defining the situation and defining how you will react to the situation. Yeah. And based on past associations, oh, I, I know what my fears are. Yeah, yeah. When the mind doesn't even have a clue what that fear of love is, is really underneath it all that's that's underneath it and you can't even get close to that until you relax into I'm a servant here I'm here to be used by spirit to approach that huge mm. resistance to, to love I love it I, this is this is the whole show for me I, <laughs> I got my answer I'm just like, it's really the difference between mastery through fear and mastery through love Mastery yeah. of fear, mastery to love. I mean, yeah. it's beautiful. And then when you really surrender it over to spirit, <laughs> you, you just get into this quantum moment where you start to see it's all your mind. And you feel such acceptance with that, that, that this idea of like crossing a border is no different than taking a walk on a sunny day mm -hmm. out in a, in a field with the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the birds, there's no difference. It's, you know, it's only these thoughts that say, oh, this is a big deal. You know, God didn't even create the border. I was saying last night, what if John Lennon's song, Imagine There's No Country, I wonder if you can, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man, that actually that, that proposition, Imagine There's No Country, is actually pointing towards this unified state of mind. And then you really don't have this idea that you're really crossing or that there are people expecting you. You know, that was some of the stress during the early years was, you know, when I was detained at the border and there was all these questions from whatever country I was going into. And then I would think, you know, there's people waiting for me. No, that's just another personal perspective. Um, I could let these people down, organizers and people know. Uh, my friend Bahani, you know, from Senegal, he told me one time he was, he was crossing from one country in Africa to another as on, on his way to Europe to be with his, his mother. And um, he got to the border and he just left his, 
his wife and children back in Senegal, he's got to get across this border to go to the next country, to go up to, to Europe, to go to Sweden. And I think the way he told the story, he, he basically was refused entry to the next country. They absolutely would not let him in. And so it was like, next, you know, go, go back, wherever you came from, that's it. And so I said, well, what did you do? Because he was very de devoted, a very prayerful life. And he went, he went back, it was kind of like a detention center. It was, a, it was just the center, they had some seats around where you passport control. And he went back and he just prayed and prayed and prayed for, for quite a while. And then, uh, as in many religious traditions, you just sing the praises to the creator. So he just sat there in his chair and he began singing. And I think he told me he sang, he sang and sang and sang and sang. And I think the hours went by, he just was singing, singing, singing. All he did was went straight into his devotion of love of God in the immigration office where sitting there just singing, 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 until finally one of the immigration officers just came out, went over to him and said, go through. <laughs> and he did. And, and to me, I thought, well, that's, that is interesting because his devotion was to God. I'm sure he lost track of time and space just praying and singing the praises of God. And then get on through here. They're not, almost like, we can't stand <laughs> To hear this anymore go through because he certainly wasn't leaving and going back as they had told him to and he was still there he wasn't arrested it was just finally go through but it was that was his story he was telling me of faith he just had such faith that he would be able to spirit would have him carry on and he just um, stayed with it i think you have to have that kind of faith to stay in the moment and choose the answer choose mm -hmm. the solution you have to have that much non-compromising faith and devotion to stay in the answer and and don't deviate into the problem which mm -hmm. is the ego which is the personal perspective mm -hmm. which has all this past learning and all these false associations with it that aren't aren't real and need to be washed away mm -hmm. i'm just amazed at how even this topic which i thought was around some kind of you need to follow through or it starts at immigration and it comes down to mastery of love versus mastery of fear. Like that's, this is a bottom up yeah. approach to me. Yeah. Because people are concerned obviously with these kind of issues, but they still only know mastery through fear. They actually believe that there's a wrong way and a right way. And they're determined to see the right way. Um, and actually that whole perspective of right and wrong in the world is still very dualistic. It's not, there will never be a solution trying to find a solution in form. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you could go deep enough, you, it starts to become, this is obviously what's happening, but until you go deep enough, it just seems like people feel they do need to take a stand for or against yeah. certain things. And, and if they don't, they will just say, you're just, wishy-washy yeah. you're you're ignorant you're you don't care like the like the yeah. thing um that's an interesting reinterpretation of that jacket uh if you look at it in terms of the outcomes right. the holy spirit yeah. saying i don't really care do you <laughs> <laughs> now that's a 360 <laughs> flip on that jacket <laughs> What? That's the Holy Spirit there. on the back of that jacket. And you go from anger like, ooh, grab her, and to, oh, there's a message for me, for my mind. The Holy Spirit's like, I don't care. Because the Holy Spirit, you know, some of you may say, well, where does it say in the Course in Miracles that the Holy Spirit doesn't care? And I'll tell you where it says. There's a line in the Course where it says, the Holy Spirit looks not to effects, for he has judged their cause is unreal. <laughs> What does that even mean? The effects are the projection. All the images of the time-space cosmos are the unreal effects coming from what? An unreal cause. God didn't create this world. The ego projected it. The unreal effects come from the unreal cause. The Holy Spirit looks not to effects because he has overlooked seeing the impossibility of the ego itself. And that's why he's not concerned at all about the effects. And that's why I don't really care, do you? <laughs> is properly interpreted as the Holy Spirit yeah. saying, 
I care about love. I care about your peace of mind. I care about you remembering yeah. your father in heaven. Yeah. And that's what I care about. I do not care about the effects. Yeah. And you need not get too caught up and hung up at, at pointing the fingers and blaming and arguing around the effects when the cause of all those unreal effects is the ego. And it's not even real. And you need to, to have a zero tolerance yeah. policy in your mind. Right. For the ego, that's where you you should devote your energy. We all, I, I mean, we all. This is so great. Like we all get caught up because I, I grew up. I told another story about Burn the other night, but he would say to me, "All that it takes for evil to exist." The famous quote is that good men do nothing. This was my mantra for growing up. Talk about pressure mm -hmm. to care about certain yeah. things, but yeah. to really not care, not as a dismissal, but. Have my mind be washed. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, I think we can talk about caring. Like caring is important, but you have to aim caring in the right direction. Jesus is asking for faith in the Holy Spirit, faith in the guidance, and faith in believing you can actually attain spiritual vision, which is not through the body's eyes and the body's ears. All of these issues and struggles and fights and blames and conflict are, are all about the effects and they're all through the body's eyes and body's ears, the five senses. And that was made by the ego to keep the mind from be still and know that I'm God. It's all been a giant defense against being still and, and discovering who you really are within. So that's the most basic premise. Now, you know, you shouldn't even beat yourself up. I would say that if you look at the vast majority of the millions of people or however many there are uh, people that are studying the Course in Miracles and then if you even looked at the Course in Miracles teachers there is so it's such a small percentage that really get what I'm talking about right now in other words it's so much basically the Course says don't try to bring the truth into the illusion but just even teaching the Course conceptually doesn't really get at the core of Bring the illusions to the truth and they'll disappear. What I'm talking about is you have to really take heart of first understand what these deep metaphysics are teachings and then actually put them into practice. And that's why I worked with students starting back in the early 1990s. And then, you know, from your time at the Peace House and the early years with the elders, the messengers and everything, it was a tracing back of every upset mm -hmm. back to I'm never upset for the reason I think and then coming back to oh it's a perceptual problem right now I mean I could say that if you really want to look at, at what Jeffrey was talking about the 79 and 80 you know is let me recognize the, the problem so it can be solved if we just focus on lesson 79 that is that you have to understand that you have a perceptual problem it's not an immigration problem it's not a nutrition problem it's not a heart problem or a skin issue problem it's not a, a pollution problem it's not a political problem it's not any of the problems that are just talked about incessantly on the news uh, and in families and chatter 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 from most people when they sit down to have a cup of tea would you believe what Trump did you know it's, it's a perceptual problem a perceptual problem, first of all, is hallucinating. Jesus calls it a hallucination in the workbook. You're seeing a world that doesn't even exist. That's a hallucination. That's like walking through a desert and hallucinating an oasis when you're hungry. This is hallucinating a world. And, and then breaking that world apart into all these different parts and issues, that's fragmentation. And then perceiving a fragmented world and then now that you perceive a fragmented world you're looking for answers and you keep looking outside in the false world for the answers that's not going to work either and then what about the voice you're listening to in your mind if you don't have zero tolerance for the ego you're going to have a committee meeting in your mind telling you all oh, should do this now you better do this wear a different dress no you forgot the lipstick no you should do this you should do that you know there's always going to be the committee meeting because this is schizophrenia. This is a split mind that doesn't know what it is, and it doesn't even know how to listen to guidance to get out of the, the complex situation. So 
for me, it comes back to, you know, like in 12 steps, you know, they go around the room, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a sex addict, or a, a drug addict, whatever you say. This is, you have to reinforce over and over and over, moment by moment, day by day, mm. you have to start with, I have a perceptual problem. Mm. And until you see it as a perceptual problem, and Jeffrey returned refer to it as a thinking problem because thinking produces the perceptions and so you have to you can't just go out and shake the images and say stop it stop being my perceptual problem because that doesn't solve it either that would be like going to the screen and hitting the screen in the movie theater saying stop it quit chasing her you know it would look ridiculous you have to actually admit you have to have an admission that you have a perceptual problem and that's what the resistance is in the mind. It's resistance to love, but it's also resistance to seeing how simple the problem mm. really is. It's a perceptual problem in the mind. It has nothing to do with immigration. It has nothing to do with nutrition or all the, the seeming political issues. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a transfer of training error. If you have... But even a Course in Miracles teacher that gets caught up onto political stances, they may have a general idea of the metaphysics of the Course, mm -hmm. but they're like saying, no, in this case, with this politician or this issue, I am not going to transfer the training. I'm not going to stay with it. It's, it's a perceptual problem in mind. I'm going to point the finger and blame this side or this person or whatever. And that's what we would simply call a transfer of training error. That's what Jesus we call it. It's funny because it's the transfer of this idea is so, I mean, obviously vast, but what's really sticking with you is mastery of fear with math. Because I, I could even feel at the start of the show for me to bring up immigration or these surface problems. It was like, this is just waste of David's time. He's just going to be like, what are you talking about this stuff? And you shouldn't be thinking like, <laughs> this is the, the voice. That, <laughs> this is the voice in your mind. That hears it, you know, it's like, I almost said, oh, don't do this show or something. Cause, but it's like, when I get the release, it feels so good. And it's like all of that version of so-called firmness or whatever, it's, it's like shifting into love. It's actually yeah. love. Like yeah. you see how simple it is. It's just, you know, yeah. So this is something I want to like keep, yeah, and, and I see everything, you know, they always say is the glass half empty or half full, but, you know, some of, I, some of the characters in the, in the Jason, the parable of Jason, you know, the biological father and the biological mother, it, you can see from a higher perspective that this has all been orchestrated as an answer for your wake-up call, your prayer. Because, you know, instead of, Vern or your biological dad influencing you, which is what they would teach us in human development, you know, well, how was your father? What did your father, how did he treat you? What did he talk about? Was he cons conspiracy theorist and all this and this? But Vern didn't cause anything. Vern was a reflection of the prayer of your mind's desire to wake up, to get this in such an extreme way, including your mother and what she went through in her life with homelessness and, and you know, it's a very unusual parable. But instead of somebody, human development would, would say, poor Jason, you poor baby. You know, you've grown up in a wacky, dysfunctional family and no wonder you're so screwed up. See, that's how uh, psychologists and human development uh, people work. I know, because I was in university for 10 years, so I learned all this stuff. I, I know the perspective. I learned it very well. You know, human, and then the, Jesus is like, no, no, no. You wanted to wake up so much that you have called forth these kind of extremes and contrasts and going over to Albania and the situation you described, all these kind of extreme things, even swimming through a lake in Australia that was infested with, uh, was it alligators or? Crocodiles. Crocodiles. Yeah. You know, at the time you didn't know, but it was all these kind of situations have been very extreme just because it's your passion to wake up, to forgive. And so you can see it from a, a miraculous perspective, like, wow, all of that was for me. All of that was for my mind to really get that it's been a perceptual problem, but there is an answer. 
that will take me beyond that perceptual problem. So it's, it's like that, it's not that I called them in because they're so loving, but I called them in because they really show me that the world isn't what I think it is. And I would even say it's not like Jason called anybody in. It's the mind, the spirit orchestrates everything for one purpose, is the atonement. And the spirit is orchestrating everything just to have a conversation like we're having in the face of this fear, you know, like I don't even want to bring this up and, and because it might just be dismissed or whatever, but, but the spirit is so gracious at really saying, no, no, it's so instructive, it's so deep, it's so profound, it's so loving, and it's all being orchestrated, including this conversation, just so that you can have the breakthrough, you know, that you've been praying for, to, to have rest, to, to feel rest, to live a life of joy and, and happiness. And that's what they were talking about, you know, Anne was talking about on her show this morning about happiness. She was trying really to use the lesson and work it into function. What does it mean my, my function and my happiness are the same? What does that really mean? That, that's a very profound question. And that's what we're doing here because, you know, there's something in you, like you said the other, I think it was last week we talked, you know, where you were talking about the hero. There's something in you when you hear something, you go, you feel a swell of something, some kind of energy come up around heroes and heroism. That same kind of joyful energy of rightness and goodness and everything, that, that is the, the Holy Spirit. But it's not a rightness in terms of form. It's right-mindedness. The whole course takes us from the form and practicing with specifics in the workbook to take us back, back, back into our mind, above the battleground, into the right mind. And then finally, from the right mind, we realize that the right mind is the solution. And then at some point, with all of our mind training, like Jeffrey was talking about, with through the 12 steps and now the course and getting more excited, excited, oh, I can, every second, it's like I'm choosing the problem or choosing the solution. You mean it's not all those complexities of the world, it's just every second I'm choosing the solution or the problem. Then you start to get into that. Like, wow, my whole life, I'm not so concerned about how it's playing out on the screen anymore. Uh, my devotion is to choose the solution. I'm going to give everything I've got, all my faith, to choosing the solution and not choosing the problem. And you can see how it's such a different context from being a human being, which is like navigating time and space, and what do I do here, what do I do there, do I say yes, do I say no? This is in the mind. But the whole world was made to keep us mindless. You know, the whole world was made to convince you you're a human being, a body with a brain, and, you know, even a lot of scientists still only talk about the brain and neurology. When they, somebody mentions the word mind, they go, oh, that's hocus pocus. But it's slowly we have to come back into the power of the mind, and we have to start to realize the power of decision. The power of decision is my own, to choose that solution. That's what true empathy is. It's, it takes a lot of practice to stay in true empathy, because that's staying in the yes, and staying in the solution, staying in alignment. But it takes a huge mental focus. And as soon as you realize that, you, you start to pull your attention away from being so concerned with what is the outcome in form. God knows not form. That's a line right from the Beyond All Idol section. God knows not form. Four words with a period but those four words with a period say a lot. That's just another way of saying God didn't create the world. God creates in spirit. God knows not form. And if I want to know God and God knows not form, you put the pieces together there. You put the pieces together. God knows not form. I want to know God. Perhaps there'll come a day when I can say, I know not form. form. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a transcendent experience, a mystical experience? That's what a revelation is. You're in this light, 
and it's all that there is and all that there ever was and then you are so happy but you know everything that there is to know because that's what the light is it's the state of, of direct union with with spirit and you will never even if you come back from that revelation you will never quite look at form the same way ever you will never buy the bait in the way that you seem to before Yeah, I've had glimpses of that the past few days, like even you wanting to do these shows. Anytime I do them, it's the feeling, and I'm just like, wow, it's like there's this honor and it feels so cool. And, yeah, and I've started to notice, like maybe there's some decision in my mind that it's safer if it's in a group to ask these questions. <laughs> like, it's so strange, but like I won't get, uh, it's really weird, but beaten or something. Like, yeah, I have no idea why. I like but it. You've like, got a nice <laughs> set here, a round table. <laughs> It's, it's so deep. If it gets too frightening, you can say, oh, somebody from the audience is going to look over here. And we got an empty chair by the microphone here. <laughs> I don't get it. Because then when you say certain things, you like speak directly to me. It's like so overwhelming. Like I, I don't even know why those particular words do it, but it's like it just shoots in. And I'm, I don't know if it's so, wow. But then it's like so much love for you at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But only you do it, really. It's not, I mean. Well, the thing that's nice about it is instead of just like tossing around news items, you know, we, we do value direct experience. And, you know, as I sit here and know that you've gone all over the world with your Canadian passport and even have a residency in Europe yeah. now and, and so forth. And then as I go around, I see Anna, she's come from Guatemala. Iceland passport, Irish passport, could go around, Denmark, Australia, <laughs> Holland, Dutch, Australia. No Americans. I can see oh. <laughs> in this room, there's been a lot of people that have dealt with immigration. And even, even uh, the Americas, like Jeffrey's, had to deal with Mexican immigration. Not just tourist visa, but a permanente. And, and Susanna, that's a process. There's been going to the immigration office and everything. So even with that, and you can see that, so the majority, Marga, the Netherlands, everyone in the room, most everyone has, has dealt with immigration in a direct way. Not as like something as a news item that they see on television, but they deal with it in a very direct way. It's like right in, in their face. And, and you have to pray. And that's when you cross a border, you have to pray. Suava was just telling me too that she came, the first time she was coming to Mexico, she had to land in the United States in Chicago, no, or, or going to the States, she was coming across. And when she got up to the line, she was wearing jeans, but you know, these kind of jeans where they just had the zipper, and it's just a, a show thing. And so, the woman said to her very seriously, what, what's in your pocket there? And then she answered, oh, this, this isn't a pocket. And then she got grilled. Like you, that's the first rule in immigration. You don't tell the immigration offer, officer what a pocket is. It's almost like, you're trying to tell me that I don't know what a pocket is. That's going to be a really, you know, they came at her like, but see, that's the whole point. You have to flow through this world where you don't know anything. I do not know what anything is for. I do not know what anything means, including this. Nothing I see means anything. That's what those lessons are about, so that Jesus can guide you with those interactions. And border crossings are wonderful mind training opportunities. Nobody can, can doubt that. And we've got two. We have two minutes. That, no, no, two, two people. That <laughs> two people. I'll check because we, Anna, I feel, might come up in a second, but they said that Laura had her hand up crying. Laura. So maybe we could bring her on and see. Oh, there she is. Hi. Can you hear me? Can't hear you yet, Laura. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes, Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh. I, I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> no, I, 
I don't, I love you, but <laughs> these, these themes are, were exactly what I don't want to listen about. Uh, immigration, crossing borders, and also guidance, because I am Mexican. <laughs> Or I believe that I am Mexican. I am going to the Quiet Dance Retreat, as I told before. And but I have not been in the United States since I was young, well, child. And, and I I was being, and I'm so afraid of crossing the border. And I I have listening to you right now and. I am realizing that I don't have a pure willingness and purpose because I'm afraid that I, when I'm going to entry, when I try try to entry, I will be refused, and what I, that will be a shame. So I'm getting I I have pride. So my I think my my willingness and my purpose is not pure and. And I'm so, and I also have these feelings of unworthiness because I am Mexican. I feel like I am not welcome to the United States. Even, I even, I have these blows that is kind of Mexican style that I, it's very, it is very comfortable to wear during traveling. And I don't want to use it because I don't want to look like a Mexican. <laughs> so, I'm 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 scared. I'm scared literally. And but I'm feeling also selfish that like I have not I haven't felt guilty enough about my the other immigrants that are crossing the border that I'm so so self focusing and I'm not going to vote during the election. Well if I if I got refused, of course I'm going to vote. <laughs> But I felt like I have to do something. And um, yesterday I was having my Starbucks decaf frappuccino light base with light milk and <laughs> non lactose. And in the Starbucks near my house, there is also a like a well, there is a row where the immigrants from the South uh, asked for help. And it was with my cappuccino, the expensive one. And I felt so idiot, so stupid, no, no. I don't know, but I, I felt at that, at that moment that I need to, to stop buying stupid things, but I don't have the courage enough to give all my things or my money to them. But because in this in this row, there there are even pregnant women. Because Veracruz is the the by Veracruz the train from. The south southern border is passed through, so I think I need help. And yesterday I was listening to the video about cómo escuchar la voz de Jesús, how to listen to Jesus' voice, and David talk about the spirit, asking the spirit to make it obvious, like Andy, Andy, or Andy and Susan talk about. Uh, before and just that I was telling that please make it obvious, please make it obvious. But I am so dumb and I feel so stupid that I am so I I feel like I am asking this Holy Spirit to make me damage because I will need like a tsunami in order to recognize Jesus voice. So. I'm so confused. I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's beautiful though. I think that you're 
bringing all this up because uh, Living Miracles has, has been doing so much travel all over the world and hosting so many retreats for so many years that when, sometimes when people come to a retreat and they have fears and anxieties and everything, then we will even have someone who's, who works with them and counsels them on practicing the miracle, preparing for the border crossing, because it's, it's not unusual. Many people who, who come to, for a devotional stay or actually even just to a retreat, like you're coming to Silent Answer, they do have, a, it brings up a huge amount of uh, emotions. And I would say too that it's, this is like a, you've hit a key issue for you because living in Veracruz, you know, there's so many uh, immigrants that are coming from Central and South America that they just have such devastating lives in their perceptions. You know, there's so much there's war and hunger and disease and the worst things of this world as the ego, it's the ego's world. They're facing that and then they come right up through your city on the way of coming to America because they're just wanting a better life. And even the border patrol people who are working, let's say a, a six hour, eight hour shift and they have to deal with all these people that are crossing the border, they're wanting a better life. You know, they're wanting everybody deep down wants to know heaven. They want to know God, even whether they even believe in God, they want, they want peace. Uh, and the thing about it is you now are having tools and, you know, to give you a little backstory is, you know, I saw that as a huge leap of faith uh, because you're not used to even traveling. When you came across here, you know, for the, for the retreat in May, I know I could feel what a big step that was for you to fly from Veracruz to even come over here. And then it was a, not an easy retreat for you. You know, you talked about being up sometimes in the middle of the night and being around so many people, how difficult it was and the, the hatred that came up and even the hatred that you feel in, in your own family, you know, because you're so willing to heal that it's just coming up. And then, um, when uh, suddenly I was here and somebody came to me and they said, well, we have a, a woman who's decided to pay it forward and there's going to be three scholarships uh, for the Quiet Answer Retreat. And I just prayed and your name uh, came to mind. And, and I said, yep, Laura, that's, that she should be contacted. And that was very important for you you know, to be, to be gifted, you know, it's not something you were thinking of doing. You were just going <laughs> to be voting in the, the presidential election, you know, right there from Veracruz. And now this whole thing with Jason picking of all themes, you know, on this show to pick immigration, this is all how much Jesus loves you underneath everything that he wants you. And he's orchestrating this for, for, you to move through these things with him there by your side with Jesus right there and all Jesus is doing is kind of whispering in your ear just stay with me I'm I'm orchestrating all this so you can be free so you can find peace of mind and you're doing it for everyone when you see those immigrants the, the pregnant woman when you see things on the news and read things about the the conflict the political conflicts or geopolitical conflicts and everything this is all just for you to have healing in your mind and and to be a way shower you know to be one that that rises above the ego and then is an example for others that, that are around you they can they will be able to see your light and but you know you have to go through this first you have to be healed before you can offer the gift of healing so I think you're doing a great job. And there's Jesus right up on the corner, right over your left shoulder. You know, he's, he's right there. We can all see him. <laughs> That's a he, he can even reach you from the cross. You know, he's up there talking away. I'm right here. I'm going to be coming, coming with you on the trip. 
He doesn't mind. He likes these props, you know. He likes wood. He was a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your willingness, yes, to pour your heart out. Why don't we have... Anna, you want to come up? You want to come up? <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, we, we didn't know which direction it was going. We do. We have all these experts on immigration in this room, literally, from all the different angles. But maybe you would like to share, uh, because you wrote me today. I've got to find it here. That this immigration has been a topic on your mind. That the gardener that now works, I guess, at the Casa, was deported from the U.S. a couple of weeks ago. I thought we had a gardener there was for months, so it must be a new gardener. Yes. Okay. Let's <laughs> stirred up a few things in you, and then your dad was telling you that be, be careful, you might be deported. And then last night the grass is greener is on the other side. Maybe you could go into what what that means and just share what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, I guess yeah, it's like this identification to where I was born and all that. It's just so strong. Um and just like when the gardener was sharing like the story his story i was just like oh my god but i just went like to his side like he's one of our my people like i've seen so many of my uh, how would you say the people that were born in my country so many of them so many people that i have known have traveled to just find a better way to have the American dream, a better life, a, a better future for their children, all that. Like, I have grown with that. And yeah, so it just felt very, very strong. Like, when I was growing up, like, I just want something different. Like, I just don't want to stay in this country because the situation is not good. Like, I always felt. I just can't leave her. I will find a way to go to this other place that will give me better opportunities. And I guess that's just so fixed in my mind. Like, um, Have you found that here in Mexico or is it still in your mind? That it's, it's, a better it's still in my mind, okay. yeah. Yeah, because now the thing here is that, okay, apparently I have 180 days because I have an American visa, right? Just because of that, if not, I'll have to ask for a special permit because I'm from Guatemala. So I come here and I have my 180 days and my father, that day exactly that I was talking to the gardener, my, like maybe 30 minutes after that I get this email, my father writing to me, be very careful. I spoke with this Mexican friend, you should only be there for 180 days a year not 180 days and go out and come back again and all that but you have a, a visa for the u.s too but that, that all only allows me the same time in the u.s in here but you and can go the to US. the u.s yes <laughs> yeah i could I'm go like to the u.s solution of yeah good. <laughs> come on up to the states <laughs> this is like great 180 days in the u.s <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that could work that's where you want to go you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all this fear. My father, you'll be deported, be careful, like da da da, like all this. And yeah, I always have this fear of like coming back. This this huge amount of fear. And even with the, the movie last night, like all this emotion was coming up. Um, we watched the movie Where to Invade Next. Yeah, yeah, Where to Invade Next. And this guy is like showing like beautiful things about these different countries, like beautiful, loving, and including, and that invite to unity and not separation, like all these beautiful things. And if you felt it was a contrast like, what, with what you've seen in the US, like, I, I don't know, I just felt it's a huge contrast because what the, you see in the U.S. is a lot better of what I've seen in my country, like prisons, education system, health, everything. And yeah, that just brought up a lot of emotion, like, wow. I was so used that that's the normal, like the normal 
thing and just watching how these different people in other countries are living such a different aspect with the same topic like all the beliefs i had were just like being yeah. chopped off yeah things a I major contrast from yeah. guatemala and then these different countries in europe yeah no comparison and it's been very big in my mind since, since i traveled when i was 15 to europe for a trip that oh i want to go back because it's a lot better there and all this, like the grass is greener in the other side. It will be better if I was there. The whole situation or the people in my country it will be better if I am in the US. Didn't you, didn't you get an offer to work with a um, Formula yes. One race car driver who wanted yes. you to fly over with him? Yes. To help support him? Yeah. I can just... Right when you were thinking of coming <laughs> here. <laughs> Formula One was, race car driver in Italy, right? Yeah, right. a great job, like a great pay. They are going to give me everything. I but, heard that and I thought, you should go. And you, you were like, <laughs> the European dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I just didn't feel I could go. Like, it just felt like, um, yeah, I don't know. It didn't feel right. Yeah deeper inside it didn't feel right yeah. well i think we like to use contrast but um even showing that michael moore movie with one of his best at showing those contrasts but we can also flip it around and show the other way because jesus says in the course you can't judge your advances from your retreats like in the state of the human perception it's so twisted and distorted that you can't even judge advance from retreat and and as a contrast it's like uh, the some of the, the indigenous tribes, or I think of the uh, Aborigines in uh, Australia, where you know they are, are seen as underdeveloped, uneducated, living out in the bush. And Marla Morgan's, you know, eventually will come up with a movie that has shows how high they are in consciousness and awareness, but their telepathic communication. They're taking clothes and jewelry when Marla Morgan went down there and literally burning them. You know, it's like it's a it's a total 360 into the miracle of of the soul or the miracle of the mind and how it's so opposite of what the world would call success and that the spiritual journey is actually like the inverse of the journey to find dream a big dream. And so you grow up with this idea of having a better life, which is a better dream. And then the spiritual journey like pulls the rug right out from under that whole thing, which is your whole driving force. And then through experiences, you know, you, you start to gain through these holy encounters and, and spiritual connections and experiences and mind training, you know, you just a whole new world opens up. So that's what we're all about, you know, that's why we're, we're doing this. And we've had people that have had to leave. I remember Kirsten was told to leave. She was basically deported. Um, <laughs> and uh, for her, that was a huge blessing when that occurred. It's not a negative kind of stigma. She was like, you have to leave the United States and you have to leave very quickly. And she ended up going and doing a gathering in Sarah. Pilkington's house over Ireland. in Tipperary, Ireland. And it was, people came in, I think Jackie. Anna Carroll. Anna Carroll was, was there. People flew in and it was a huge mind opening experience of how, of divine providence of how trust settles everything. So those are the kind of experiences that you're, you're in for. That there's, it seems to be a lot of cracking open, but then oof, the spirit comes up underneath you. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing all that, though. That's, that's important. Good for us to know as we all pray where, where you're going, what you're doing. Yeah. We always like to keep you down in Mexico because of your Spanish skills, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you're going to America. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Annie. Yeah. Okay. Well, unless you have a feeling about Anyone else is to speak? It's probably wrapping up to yeah. me. So. Yeah, it's a beautiful.
beautiful full show. Full show. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, no, he's not here. Is Netta Boyne on right now? She was. We're just thinking of maybe finishing off with a song. If she's Netta here. or Frank? Frank is gone. That's Frank Ochuli. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Pietti. That's okay. Yeah, we were just going to, we may call upon you sometime if, like when Netta just has her, uh, her album out, The Light Has Come, and, and Frank just yesterday sent me the most glorious uh, song from Sweden in Swedish, but I could just, I just listened to it. I don't even know sp Swedish, but I could feel the love just emanating from this song, and he did send me the translation in English, and so... Um, yeah, I've got it in my phone, but but uh, we were thinking if Frank was still on, we might uh, have him uh, share it or something. We'd like to be involve you from time to time, keep you on your toes. <laughs> Maybe in support of Laura and Anna, we could play just thirty seconds of the the other video to end off the segment. Because yeah, you'll see why when we play it. So if Nicholas, if you're there. Maybe, oh, he is, okay. You could just line that up and we'll end the segment with a celebration of, of welcoming and inclusion. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>